grief is one of those concepts that is difficult to define. And even if you could, it wouldn't matter because the definition of it would never match the experience of feeling it. Grief, this sense of feeling and loss, being caught in a limbo between remembering and forgetting, experiencing tragedy and wanting it to mean something, but also needing to put it aside and move on at some point, and yet never forget at the same time. We've established during this podcast series the personal loss that millions, tens of millions of people must have been facing in the aftermath of the Taiping Civil War and the ways that this would have generational impacts to come. And just as governments and local officials and different interest groups were competing, in a sense, to make use of that grief, some during the Taiping Civil War grappled with loss in a more personal fashion. Historian Toby Meyer Fong points to memoirs, diaries, poetry, these types of things as what she calls personal talismans against forgetting. In her book, What Remains, she brings up the case of Zhang Guanglai. His mother was murdered by the Taiping, right in front of him, by the way. His brothers were captured and killed. His sister attempted suicide at one point, and her ultimate status was simply unknown. And he wrote a memoir called A Record of 1861. It's important because it's a memoir about grief and suffering and loss, not about ideology and politics, as so much of the historical dead seem to be remembered through. It does touch on this inexpressible nature of grief and the ways that state commemoration and commemoration by local officials, like we talked about in the last episode, would always be inadequate as a expression of feeling. Perhaps his motivation in writing it was merely to maintain the memory of his mother, maybe to share his grief with others who could identify. And it seems he also wanted to highlight the contradictory and confusing feelings that surfaced as a result of the contrasting values of the orderly and official state commemorations of loss that we talked about in the last episode and his own personal inexpressible nature of grief. He points out that, quote, we are most grateful for imperial beneficence in generously adding posthumous honors for her chaste heart and unyielding spirit, end quote. But he also says, quote, whereas the emperor takes these as commendable, her sons and grandsons are filled with an inexhaustible distress and moreover hold on to a pain that is difficult to articulate, end quote. Toby Meyer Fong adds, quote, he refers repeatedly to his undiminished grief and the tears that accompany his obsessive reflections on the past, even after 20 years. Zhang thus established a contrast between the formulaic language of commemoration and the overwhelming inexpressibility of grief. End quote. If you remember way back in episode one of this series, we talked about Yu Ji. He was this guy who was going around the war-ravaged places in China, and he was preaching this divine reward and divine punishment narrative. 
some would argue this is some sort of attempt to create order out of chaos. The idea being that the lives lost and the personal grief felt because of death and destruction as a result of the war was ultimately a noble sacrifice that would be rewarded, whether it was karma for future generations or benefits in this realm, somehow that merit and that virtue would be rewarded and on the flip side, acting badly would result in punishment. And at the end of this cycle, according to Yu Ji, there would be a symbolic restoration of order where the good are rewarded and everybody's happy again and the emperor is back in charge and everything's great. So it's interesting to compare that type of philosophy with what someone like Zhang Guanglai is feeling, just this emptiness. And rather than relying on narratives of good and evil or state commemorations, in the aftermath of the Taiping Civil War, ordinary people like Zhang Guanglai at least attempted to come to terms with loss and suffering in their own personal ways. Toby Meyer Fong says, quote, Zhang Guanglai's record of 1861 reminds us that the post-war period was not a time of optimistic recovery, tidy rebuilding, and orderly documentation of righteous deaths. Life and politics were never that simple, and the processes of renewal and commemoration were never so neat. Moreover, because the instruments of commemoration, appropriated by local elites and provincial officials acting in the name of the state, failed to requite loss, individuals sought solace in their own acts of remembrance or release through writing. In his book, Zhang Guanglai asserts the importance of disorderly and subjective memory. The book functions as a site in which a grieving son could better remember the person his mother had been. The image of his mother, officially commemorated, seemed alienated and elevated from the particular person he warmly recalled feeding him porridge at the dinner table and cuddling him at night. He recorded these fragmentary images in words, thereby constructing one of himself consumed by grief. In so doing, he also defied the absolute moral clarity of official narratives. End quote. Chinese chronicler Gao Ding wrote, quote, Those who were fortunate enough not to die also experienced extremes that cannot readily be recorded by anyone. Thus, today, now that the pain has settled and we can reflect on that pain, very few can record it in orderly words. End quote. A useful reminder there about the scale and scope of the tragedy that was the Taiping Civil War and how, for the survivors, it was difficult, if not impossible, simply to express what they went through. This was a generationally devastating historical event, obviously for the victims, but also for the survivors. As we've talked about before, many put the Taiping Civil War in the greater context of the future of China, which would see the revolution of 1911, another civil war in the mid-20th century, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, generation over generation experiencing what Zhang Guanglai is talking about here. This inexpressible nature of grief as a uniquely devastating feeling and emotion. Ultimately, Toby Meyer Fong sums it all up by saying, quote, When the war was over, what remained? Emotions, certainly. Among them, 
anger at the perfidy of the Qing state and its local representatives, especially for their failure to live up to implied promises of protection and frustration at the slow pace of reconstruction in the absence of material support from the center. A commemorative landscape marked by competing interests. Mass graves and shrines honoring the Hunan army dead, the local dead, the righteous dead variously constituted and competitively tended. Grief for countless loved ones lost in war to starvation, violence, and disease. An image of home, a place of safety to which many were unable to return. Or on return, the sudden realization that what was longed for was no longer there. Troubling memories of roads and canals crowded with refugees and captives, waterways clogged with corpses, human flesh for sale in the markets, disturbing recollections of wandering, of begging, and of being trussed by the hair. Tattooed faces, stubbled foreheads, the sound of cannon fire, the familiar cadence of a hometown accent, the pervasive smell of rot. Frustrated searches for the living, and failing that, for the remains of the dead. A sense that what was once true and known was lost, uncertain, unstable, and incomplete. A search for answers, for new certainties encoded in reward and retribution, or later, revolution and a lingering sense of unease over what had been strategically forgotten. Mm-hmm.